right. Well, it's our last night together. And all the hymns that's been sang and are sung and, and uh, the specials that's been done has been wonderful and beautiful. And again, as the Lord has done all week, he's lined everything up Amen. with what I'm about to preach. But the title, what I've entitled this message for tonight is Departing in Darkness. My mind was on this as I locked myself up again today in that cottage and just thinking about how this is the last night, this is the last hour, and the Lord has stirred here this week in a great Amen. way. I have seen people uh, stirred before my eyes to the point it changed the, the, the route I was taking as I started off in the book of Haggai, and the Lord quickly turned me to salvation and revival. Amen. So the hour has come. There was a beginning, there's been a middle, and now we're at the end. I know there's been movement. I have felt the presence of the Lord in our midst. I have seen him shake some. I've seen him encourage others and challenge us all. But tonight I want to look at what happens when one that's in the midst rejects the truth. Mm -hmm. At the end of this week, we will all depart. Right. I know this is a monthly fellowship for uh, many of you, and I'm thankful to meet many of you already. But nevertheless, at the end of the night, we will all depart. So, I think what we'll do is we'll just start in the book of Matthew, chapter 26. Because I have prayed for the folks that's been with us and the ones I've seen stirred and watch them as the Lord dealt with them and watch them try not to pay attention and try to distract themselves and try to think of anything else but when the Lord's stirring he's stirring. Amen. And I want us to really get a good glimpse of how wonderful the Lord is. Chapter 26 and verse 17. Verse 17, it says, Now the first day of the feast of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus, saying unto him, Where wilt thou that we prepare for thee to eat the Passover? And he said, Go into the city to such a man, and say unto him, The master saith, My time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at thy house with my disciples. And the disciples did as Jesus had appointed them, and they made ready the Passover. Now when the evening was come, or when the evening was come, he sat down with the twelve. And as they did eat, he said, Verily I say unto you, that one of you shall betray me. And they were exceeding sorrowful, and began every one of them to say unto him, Lord, is it I? Mm -hmm. I ask you tonight, are you a disciple? Are you truly a God-saved disciple? Mm. I don't know when I'll be back this way again. But I have walked into a church that was full of joy and fellowship, and I feel the love and the presence of the Lord here. But as I have preached this week, I have watched people, as I said, be stirred and walk out into darkness. Mm -hmm. yeah. And to be stirred again, and to walk out into darkness. Right. I come in tonight with no preconceived ideas that I would be able to see the seed bear fruit. But would that be a joy? Oh, man. I ask you tonight, where are you? Where are you? Let us think about the scene that is taking place here. In Luke 22, 24 through 30, if you'll turn there with me, and I'm not necessarily saying I'm lining all these up in order for you tonight. But as they came to my mind, this is how I wrote them down. 
In Luke 22, verse 24, we start right off there and it says, And there was also a strife among them, which of them should be accounted the greatest? And he said unto them, The king, kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and they that exercise authority upon them are called benefactors. But ye shall not be so. But he that is greatest among you, let him be as the younger. Amen. And he that is chief, as he that do, doth serve. For whether, it, for whether is greater, he that sitteth at meat, or he that serveth, is not he that sitteth at meat? But I am among you, as he that serveth. Ye are they which have continued with me, in my temptations. Mm -hmm. If you will now, go to John chapter 13. As you're turning there, uh, continue with that scene. Think about it. They've been walking with the Lord Jesus Christ. They've been in the presence of sovereign, sovereignty. They've been in his midst. And here they are arguing about who would be first, who would be greatest, who would be in his right hand, who, who's going to be the greatest among us. And he lays it back on. Here in John 13, what we're fixing to read, we, we know what he's fixing to do. I, I know that many in here, I know most in here know the Bible, and I'm bringing nothing new to the table for you. But I just want you to consider tonight and think about these things. When we tend to get puffed up with pride, or we tend to uh, start to get a, a bad attitude towards other brethren or other churches or other people or whatever, and we want to exalt ourselves above that. Let's see what our Lord does here. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. Amen. And supper being ended, the devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he was come from God and went to God, he riseth from supper and laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. Then cometh he to Simon Peter, and Peter saith unto him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? Jesus answered and said unto him, What I do thou knowest not, but thou shalt know hereafter. Amen. What we have here is even under this load, the hour has come. What does that mean? Well, he knows the time has, the time has come. And we may get to it, we may not, but we know in John 17, he says there, the work which thou gavest me to finish is, is done. We Amen. know that it's done. Amen. And I believe in that moment, he was speaking of the church. Because in 1 Corinthians 12, 28, it says, and God has set some in the church, first apostles. Amen. You go over to Luke 6, he prayed all night. And after praying all night, he comes out of the mount, he calls all his disciples unto him, all of them, and it says, of them. Amen. Yeah. He chose 12. All right. Many works had been done, much healing. People, people that were blind made to see. People that could not hear made to hear. People that could not walk could stand and walk. Many works had been done. But the hour had come. You notice when he washed their feet, Peter's first response was, a, No, Lord, let me. Let me. Let me serve, Lord. Let me wash the feet. You notice none of the other disciples spoke a word. Right. None of them offered to get out and get down with our Lord and wash feet. They had a problem. Mm -hmm. They had a problem within themselves. With their problem, and the Lord knows it, he's on, he's down at their feet washing the filth of the world mm -hmm. off of them. 
They didn't know what he was doing. That word, when it says wash there, when you look that up in the Greek and you look in the definition of it, it means bathe, completely bathe. Mm -hmm. Oh, he was doing a work in their midst and they did not know it. The Bible gives us other examples of humility. You can find it in Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 11, and 1 Peter 5, 5. And we know that all things were given unto him, mm -hmm. our Savior, our Lord, Amen. washing feet. Now we know that there's many that take that to the nth degree, but what was he doing? He was leading them, them the example of of serving others. Mm -hmm. His whole life here on earth, all he did was serve others. And one of his final acts was to wash the dirt, the dust off of his disciples' feet. Amen. That's one, and you got to understand in the Jewish custom and culture, that's one of the most menial things you can do. And he was doing it. Amen. A king unseen. On his knees, right. washing feet. How is it that we elevate ourselves so fast? Mm -hmm. How is it that two days from now we will have already forgot this message and start to elevate ourselves again? We ought to leave those double doors right there or after the good fellowship downstairs, the food we fill our bellies with, which is another blessing of God, we ought to leave out of here being servants willing to wash feet. Amen. Willing to minister. Where I'm at down there, you know, uh, we got some real rough characters. I, I, the town we're in is called Sefner. The sort of the running joke that people say about Sefner, they call it Methner. <laughs> when I went there, I don't know that I could say this, but I can say it now. Would you wash a Method's feet? I tell people all the time, I hope they come to the doors with the shrapnel all in their faces and their hair all messed up and however they look. I don't care if they got tattoos from their hair to their toes. Amen. Come. Amen. Come. Right. Come to the Lord Jesus Christ. The hour had come and his shoulders were heavy. You know, it's an interesting thing. I think we forget the government. He it said the Bible says he is on his what? Shoulder. Right. You know, when he goes out to get that one, it was on his shoulders. Mm -hmm. A definition of love right there within that. But not all were clean here when he washed the disciples' feet. Right. So that's why I brought that up. When it says wash, it means to be bathed completely. But where I want to head tonight is to think about this man, Judas. Jesus would go to the cross of Calvary. The Old Testament saints have been looking forward to that. They were looking to the cross. We as New Testament saints, we look back at the cross. I believe we're saved all the same way myself. Uh, I know others have their views and opinions, but uh, I believe I can prove that with the Bible. But they were looking for the Messiah to come. We look back at the Lord that has come, and he is Lord. Amen. And I'm going to tell you, we're going to get through this, but how you cannot, how, and I'm friends with people that can't see it, but how you cannot see the sovereignty of God in this very lesson. Mm -hmm. For those that want to deny it, before we go any further, we know he was chosen to do what? Fulfill the scriptures. That's it. So for those that want to deny it, you just know this, he chose them. Amen. Those that are saved tonight, that ought to, make, that ought to bring out a good amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. So are you a disciple? So now I'm going to ask you, are you deceived? Because we see here in verse 2 of chapter 13, it says, And supper being ended, the devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. See, when we read the Bible sometimes, it's almost like we glass over. But you have to understand, and that's what's scary for me about these folks that I've seen stirred this week to walk in and out, not trusting in the Lord. But when the devil put it in his heart, we're not talking about he just went over and just, 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 just laid it down there. No, he thrust it. Amen. 
He thrust it into his heart. You can check me on the definition of it. That's just what he did. He thrust it into his heart. Mm -hmm. Ephesians chapter 6 talks a lot about the things we ought to be guarding, guarding with, right? Mm -hmm. The shield of faith. Judas didn't have one. He did not have one. Amen. Judas was unsaved. You're right. You don't lose salvation. Amen. And if you question your salvation, I want to tell you this because I preached here all week and I, I want to be sure that we're clear on this. There's two sides to the cross. You think of it like this. Two sides of the cross. On one side, it says God saves. The Lord saves. On the other side, it says believe. So which part do you doubt? You doubt God? I don't. Amen. So, you doubt you believe? There's the question. That doesn't take away from the sovereignty of God. God doesn't change, so you can leave that side alone. Mm -hmm. The devil had thrust into the heart of Judas, and now he's here, he's on the scene. But he had no armor. I want to go to Ephesians 6 for just a moment, and then we'll be right back here to John 13. Because for some of these young folks, and they may not know this, but I want, I want them to see the armor of God and why it's so important. And it really, for me, it, well, we'll start in 11. It says, it says to put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles, this methodia, that means methods, of the devil. Amen. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. And the reason he chose that word wrestle is because in those times when they wrestled and lost, your eyes were gouged out. The loser went blind for the rest of his life. What he's saying is not a game. Salvation is not a game. Amen. It's very real. And as Brother Larry said, I don't know what 2024 holds. I know 2023 has been strange enough. Mm -hmm. But make your calling and election sure. Amen. <clears throat> For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, because of this, for what you've heard, wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day. How's it going in 2023? Right. And having done all to stand, stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Amen. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. The reason I brought you there is it's the same thing that happened to Judas. Mm -hmm. The fiery darts of the wicked. Amen. And the devil had been put in his heart. So now I want us to think about this. We, we know that the Lord looks on the heart. Jeremiah 17, verses 9 through 10 says, The heart is deceitful above all things. And that hit me today as many times as we've read that verse and we call that verse out, above all things. There you go. Can y'all think of some wicked things around us right now in our communities, in the areas, on TV, on Facebook, on YouTube, on your cell phones, on your computer? But the worst of all, the heart. All things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? For those of you that's been stirred and walk out of here, you think, well, I know my heart. No, you don't. That's right. No, you don't. Mm -mm. I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins, even to give to every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. Now, Judas had the devil put firmly 
and his heart. And now the real Judas is going to be coming out. Mm -hmm. But before everything is revealed, we got to think about this. Again, to remind you, the scriptures had to be fulfilled. So my next question would be, are you discerning? Are you discerning what's been preached here this week? You've heard the gospel night after night. We've talked about uh, in Haggai, we, we had the motivation there to encourage you to get back to where you need to be. Remember, I said the Lord, he said, this people mm -hmm. say the time has not come. He wasn't talking about the world. He wasn't talking about the heathen. He was talking about his people, Amen. this people. Amen. He sends a messenger. And that was no accidental meeting they had. Then we go on to the Philippian jailer. Roughly 935 miles, like I said, not, don't hold me to it. Don't cast me out for being a Baptist if I'm wrong on the mileage. But I'm going to tell you, it was a long ways. Mm -hmm. And he had plans to go somewhere else, and the Lord stopped him in his tracks. Gave him a vision, a man of Macedonia waving to come help. So he goes on his way. On the way, Lydia saved. What great encouragement. I know as a preacher, when, I mean, it, you, you have dry spouts and uh, dry fans when one, one trusts the Lord Jesus Christ and you see fruit immediately from that. It, you, what an encouragement. Amen. He's preaching, preacher. But then he finally gets to his destination. And that night I was talking about the man that was imprisoned was on the other side of the bars. Mm -hmm. The man that was imprisoned did not have his feet fast and stopped. Paul was the free man. That's right. He's in the lower prison, praising, singing praises unto God and praying. The man in bondage was on the outside. That's right. And he got set free. He got set free by the power of God. So, are you discerning? Matthew 26, 24 says, The Son of Man goeth as it is written of him, but woe unto that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It had been good for that man if he had not been born. Mm -hmm. But Judas was born. Right. He was born. The information we can find on that says that he was born about around 3 B.C. Born in Kiriath. The name Judas means praised. When you look it up, isn't that something? Mm. It means praised, but when's the, anybody named Judas in here? <laughs> mm. It quickly turned. It quickly turned. The spiritual meaning that's been tagged with it is the spirit of greediness. Mm. But now, I want to talk about the character of Judas. All we, when we think of Judas as scared, all we go is, ooh, mercy. Mm -hmm. But let's, let's take another view of Judas. And this is what concerns me about our young folk. It concerns me about all folk. Judas. Judas knew the word. Mm -hmm. yeah. He knew the word. He was a student. Right. He was a disciple. He was a follower. He walked with Christ. <coughs> he obeyed and completed whatever task was asked of him. He was very faithful in that. I believe he prayed. I believe he sang. I believe he fellowshiped. I believe he dressed just like the others. I believe he did ministry. We know he did. You can find it in the gospel. Right. I believe he, I believe he, he talked about the poor a little bit, and, and he did many things like that. I believe he was light. Probably. I believe he was. You know, you say, well, how could you think that, Brother Pierce? How could you think that he was like? I mean, this, this, uh, I mean, the devil's been putting his heart and he's going to betray our Lord and Savior. How in the world can you say he's like? Because when the question came up, they all said, is it I? It's it. What does that show you? It shows you how frail man is. Amen. Mm -hmm. And it also shows you that no one would have guessed it was Judas. Yeah. And I've had my mind on some that I've seen stirring here, and as I prayed today about it, I thought, you know what, Lord, you may be stirring one that I haven't even recognized. <coughs> but that's his business. Amen. Yeah. 
Uh, you know, like I tell them at our church, we, we, we do sing a hymn at the end. We have an invitation. Some don't agree with that. Some do. But I tell the church, we're not going to sing 47 verses until I get a trophy. <laughs> <laughs> You've heard the gospel preached. Now's your time. You want, you, uh, you want, to, you want to profess that you're saved? Great. You, you, maybe you're saved and you need to be scripturally baptized and yoke up with the church like you should. Great. <laughs> But the time span is going to be short for you. We're not going to sit up here for an hour and a half. Amen. And you don't have to come here to get saved. You may have been saved driving to church. You may have been saved earlier in the week. You may have been saved right there in the pew. I had a young girl recently. Uh, we just baptized her not too long ago. And already, I mean, the whole, the whole, her, there's a different glow about her. Amen. Used to keep her hair over her face. Now it's pulled back where you can see her. Beautiful girl. Just, there's just a shine about her. But when she, she waited, she didn't come up when we sang, but uh, everybody was leaving. She comes up, she's trembling. She says, can I talk to you? I said, sure. She says, I've trusted the Lord. Amen. Because my question when children come to me, I'm like, what are you here for? You know, I really try to coach them into it. I'm like, what are you doing here? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm not mean about it, but I don't, I don't want to lead in any way. And I said, so when were you saved? She said, just a few minutes ago. Minutes ago. I said, where? She said, right back there in that pew. Amen. I said, amen. My next question, I said, so what now? She goes, pastor, I need to be baptized. Amen. I said, wow, then you know, that's how they did it in the Bible. <laughs> but what I'm saying is, just because he wrote the part, talked the part, walked the part, did the part, he had everything that the other disciples did. He had everything that, he was an apostle. Mm -hmm. You understand, I mean, he was at that mount. He was one of the ones called out. Now, I will tell you, if you go through your Bible, you'll find he's always the last one. He's always the last one. But he looked the part. I'm gonna go to Psalm 41, verse nine. It says, Yea, mine own, oh, let me back up. This is a Psalm of David, so we know who that is. It's a Psalm of David, King David. Verse 9, it says, Yea, my own familiar friend, and whom I trusted, which did eat of my bread, hath lifted up his heel against me. Amen. Now, how does someone get into your trust? They look the part, they talk the part, right. they're dedicated, they're loyal, do anything preacher says. Cut the grass, paint the building. And you say, well, who could that have been? I, well, I believe if you go to 2 Samuel, you'll find that. In chapter 15. Because when you think, of, you think of David, the first thing that comes up to your mind is Jonathan. Well, we know it wasn't Jonathan. 2 Samuel 15, verse 31. And one told David, saying, Ahithophel is among the conspirators with Absalom. And David said, O Lord, I pray thee, turn the counsel of Ahithophel into foolishness. Now, we're going to go to chapter 17, right there in 2 Samuel, chapter 17, verse 23. We're going to see something very similar to who we're discussing tonight. And the counsel of Ahithophel, when he counseled in those days, was as if a man had inquired at the oracle of God. So was all the counsel of Ahithophel, born with David and Absalom. And what you'll find out is that he actually killed himself. Hmm. That same very man. Right. 
But we're going to move forward, push forward. I got more verses wrote down. Psalm 55, 20, Psalm 109, 8, Psalm 109, 17. But I don't think we need to beat that to death to get you to understand what I'm saying here tonight. There's folks in here that are not saved that are wearing nice clothes. Mm -hmm. There's folks that are saved that are not saved here tonight that just sang a hymn. Mm -hmm. It is well with my soul. Did you mean it? Mm. Right. Could you mean it? If you're unsaved, what you're saying is well with my soul to be in hell. And I know there's some heathen out there that make a joke of it. Well, when I get there, I'll party with my friends. You won't party, my friend. You're right. Amen. You will not. Just need to read the Bible. And you'll find out what you'll be wanting. Right. If someone can go back and tell my family, mm. it's not a party and it's not a game. And I don't care how old you are. If you're old enough to understand you've sinned, You've transgressed, you've rebelled against God, you're condemned. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's a fact. You say, but I got plenty of time, preacher, I'm young. Yeah, I was too once. <laughs> now, some of you say, 50 is not old. Well, 50 is not 20. <laughs> right? 50 is not 15 when I trusted the Lord. And I'm going to tell you in 2023, I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, be putting. Uh, I wouldn't be putting it off to think I'm going to get to be 50. I don't know. No man knows the time. But I can tell you by the Bible and you, with the Bible using as your lens, <laughs> I wouldn't waste time. Amen. You say, well, God's sovereign. It doesn't matter. I mean, if I'm going to be saved, I'm going to be saved. The Bible says believe. Amen. Amen. Judas, Judas walked with our Lord and Savior. He had no he had no understanding of what it meant to be saved. When you're saved, it makes a difference. When you're saved, even when you mess up, you know that you're Lord above. You know you're saved, and you know he'll still forgive you. Mm -hmm. And as we know in Romans 6, and we know it's not it's not a license to sin. But when you do sin and you're saved, there's immediate conviction about it. I don't know how it deals with you, but I know as a young man that I know as a saved folk hanging around people and I do something wrong, it was like immediate heat just come over me. Mm -hmm. I can't explain the feeling. You know why? Because the Holy Spirit. Right. You know why none of my buddies felt it? They wasn't saved. Right. They had no remorse. They didn't have a godly sorrow. They had a worldly sorrow. And there's right. a difference. Amen. There's a difference. Amen. So I want to ask you now, where are you? Let's go to John 18. Verse 1, it says, When Jesus had spoken these words, he went forth with his disciples over the book of Kedron, where was a garden, into the which he entered and his disciples. And Judas also, which betrayed him, he's still with him, mm -hmm. knew the place. For Jesus, Jesus oft times resorted thither with his disciples. Judas then, having received a band of men and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, cometh thither with lanterns and torches and weapons. Mm -hmm. Now, that may not mean much to you, but you got to think about it. They're coming after the Lamb of God with weapons. Mm -hmm. They're coming after the one that is fixing to go to the cross of Calvary, of Golgotha, and hang, and bleed, and die sinless. And they're bringing weapons. <laughs> and who, who would tell them to do such a thing? See, I've read commentary on it, and everyone's got their view, but I'm just going to put something out there to think about. Could it be when he departed to go do what he had to do? Mm -hmm. Could it be that when he looked in the eyes of Jesus, he knew Jesus knew? Because right. Jesus is the one who told him yeah. to go ahead and go. The rest of them thought he was off on doing some ministry. Yeah. He was that good, folks. 
Could it be that he thought maybe they were going to try some trickery to protect him? Because there's many times that those Jews had been wanting to kill him and get a hold of him and put their hands on him, but they just never could. Mm -hmm. But the hour has come. Yeah. Watch as we continue on here. Verse 4. Jesus knowing, or Jesus therefore knowing all things that should come upon him went forth and said unto them, Whom seek ye? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus saith unto them, I am he. Amen. Or, if you like, I am. Yes, it. <laughs> and Judas also, which betrayed him, stood with them. And that's what I want to ask you tonight. Judas crossed a line that he could never go back on. Mm -hmm. Right there before your eyes in the Word of God, it says that Judas stood with them. Yeah. And if you're rejecting Jesus Christ as your Savior tonight, guess who you're standing with? Them. Mm -hmm. That's right. You say, well, I'm not that bad. Well, neither were they at some point. Right. You're not born into prison. Mm. The penitentiary is full of people that were somebody's baby. Somebody's little precious. Right. Somebody's little princess. Somebody's little junior. He crossed the line to never return. And not only that, he kisses him. <laughs> now we know here in America, a kiss is a sign of love and devotion. But the Jews, with their customs and cultures, that's very big. I mean, that's, that's the way they did things. If we were to have their customs and culture, not everybody would have been kissing them here tonight. Mmm, good to see you. Mm. We know that wasn't going to happen by my illustration the other night about the spittle. Right? I got close, and she's already... But with his spittle, he healed the eyes. Amen. But he crossed the line to never return. It would be a real shame to be up here all week. And, and you got to know, you got to understand because you don't know me. I don't mean so Pastor Pierce can go home with a trophy. But why not tonight? Amen. Why not now? Yeah. I believe in the sovereignty of God, and I believe that this shows his sovereignty as Judas was chosen. Mm -hmm. That was a living soul. That was a man. That was a man that got as close as you can get to the Savior. Mm -hmm. To the point on, on the last moment, he goes, Does that scare you? Mm -hmm. It calls me drunk. And to think you'd shove it off and shove it off. Why would you cross a line? You say, well, but there, there's always tomorrow, is there? I said earlier in the week, they, the Bible says you're not promised tomorrow. This may be your last night in a pew. This may be your last night assembling with God's people. And wouldn't that be a shame to step through those doors and cross a line? Mm -hmm. And never come back. That'd be a real shame. Some might say, well, it is God's will, isn't it? What if it's your little one? That wouldn't be a shame. What if it's your wife, your husband, your daughter, your son? That wouldn't be a shame. See, it's never a shame when someone else's. But it's a soul count the cost. What would a man give in exchange for his soul? Maybe you've noticed tonight, I'm a little more somber. And I am. Because the hour's come. I could preach all night, but I know I know we can't. 
But don't put off in this moment what you may not have another breath to be clothed in. Mm -hmm. To be clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Where are you? He stood with him. The power of God there, when he says, I am, we know the Jews, it, that was a demonstration of the power of God. It showed he was God. Mm -hmm. And that moment when he said, I am, and they flew back and hit the ground, it showed just who he was. Mm -hmm. right. Think about that. He kissed God. Mm -hmm. And for the Romans over there, in their mind, it showed rank and order. I know, so what, none of them swinging their stuff around and they stood back up, were they? Right. But he willfully went. Amen. He showed them, you're not going to tell me because I'm coming. Because the hour is coming. <clears throat> so to close out tonight, what are you? Are you important? Are you valuable? Let's look at it from two angles. Are you important to the Lord? Are you valuable to God? Or is it the world? Does your worldly friends make you feel better about yourself? Because I'm fixing to show you where they'll leave you. Does your worldly friends make you feel valuable? Of great use to them? The book of 1 John, I'm going to read just a few verses out of there. Chapter 2. Verse 15, it says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. Amen. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. Amen. And the world passeth away and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Amen. Even the heathen knows there's something coming. This world won't last forever. Amen. And if that's where your love is, that's where you're going to be. Burn up. Mm -hmm. Burn up. Matthew 27 and John 3 and I'm done because I'm going to show you those of you that says well I got some good friends you just don't know them I don't care I, may, I don't care to know them <laughs> I'm not here to make worldly friends but I'm here because God has orchestrated this amen and we as Baptists sometimes get scared of saying things like that and getting Pentecostal. But I'm going to tell you, God has orchestrated this meeting. Amen. All week and tonight. And the hours come. It's fixing to be done. Here's what the world will do with you. This is Judas again. Verse 1, chapter 27. When the morning was come, all the chief priests and elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. And when they had bound him, they led him away and delivered him to Pontius Pilate, the governor. Then Judas, which had betrayed him, when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself right. and brought again the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned and that I have betrayed the innocent blood. And they said, look at their attitude. This is your friends. This is, this is the world for you. Right. Yeah. And they said, what is that to us? Right. What is that to us? You know why I know that? Young folk, you listen. You see gray hair, but I'm going to tell you, there's a young man in here. <laughs> I went to public high school. I was saved at 15. I spent my days in public high school. I had some really good friends. My best friend died at 38, drank himself to death. Mm. 
I kept telling him, you need to change. You need to trust the Lord Jesus Christ. You need to trust the Lord. And unfortunately, he could say, well, you've changed. I haven't. Hmm. Well, I changed because I got back where I should be. He says, but I haven't. And I said, I know that's the problem. Mm -hmm. In October, backdrop, he called me. He called his first few words, be some cuss words and things. I said, I don't want to hear it. I hang up. In October, he called me and he says, hey, he says, hey, hey, hey don't, don't hang up. Mm -hmm. He says, could you come by and see me? I said, I'm not doing that anymore. I'm not hanging out. I'm not, I got a wife. I'm not interested. He says, no, no, you don't understand. Would you bring your Bible? Man. So I go out there, I bring his Bible, I bring the Bible. I went through it five times with him because I can't believe my eyes. <laughs> I mean, that's, I mean, we say it's simple, just believe, but when then someone believes, we're like, okay, let's, let's go over this again. <laughs> For the first time in his life, he stood up, he hugged, bear hugged. He's a big, brawny guy. I mean, he'd, he'd brawl with you. That squeezed the air out of me. Shaking, trembling. And I said, Brian, pray with me. Mm -hmm. We got down. I didn't tell him what to say. I just started praying, and I just stopped and went silent. I didn't tell him, okay, now. <laughs> First time in his life he prayed. Hey, Amen. He believed and trusted sitting there. The Lord saved him sitting there. But after he was saved, we prayed. And he didn't have to pray. I was giving some silence in case he wants to, and he did. And you talk about making your heart soft. Amen. To hear one that you didn't think would ever trust in the Lord, speak to the Lord for the first time, and speak to him like he knows him. Amen. The next day, he runs into town. All his old buddies out there started cussing, and for his first word, don't cuss me, I'm saved. Amen. He didn't have a long time to show any fruit because he died in February. Mm. He knew the hour had come. Mm -hmm. Some of his family didn't even know how bad it was. I knew because before I left that night, he wanted me to go look over there in his closet. And I went and looked and it was a bucket with blood about that deep in it. He said, that comes out when I sleep. Because remember, he hadn't changed. The world is not your friend, and they will leave you alone. Watch here in Judas, verse 5, it says, And he cast down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. And the chief, and the chief priest took the silver pieces and said, It is not lawful for to put them into the treasury because it is the price of blood. Can you believe to be that really? Well, I can. I mean, there's people out there right now like that. Mm -hmm. Be so religious that they think they're above that. But watch what they did with him. And that's, I started the title of the message from dwelling with the sovereign to strangers. He was buried with strangers. Mm -hmm. And that word strangers means aliens. We ought to understand that in 2023. You're right. And they took counsel and bought with them the potter's field to bury strangers in. Wherefore that field was called the field of blood unto this day. And you find that over in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8 as well. <coughs> what are you going to do? The hours come. In John chapter 3, I'm going to end it on John chapter 3 as I have two or three nights. Because I want you to get it in your head. I want when you start thinking about where you are, I want you to remember this. I want it to come up in your head when you think of it. When you're sitting there trying to reason with God and debate back and forth how good you are and I'm not, I'm not worthy of hell and back and forth. I want you to remember this because it's very, very important. It's Bible. I'm not adding anything to it. I'm just telling you what it says. John chapter 3. We, we know verse 16. I, I, I'm going to speed up for you. Let's just, let's go ahead to uh, verse 17. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned. 
But he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Amen. And this is the condemnation. This is the chrysis. K-R-I-S-I-S, Greek, English, crisis. Mm -hmm. This is the crisis. That light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Mm -hmm. To keep from preaching long, I'm shutting things down. But I'm going to tell you this. You go back and look at it yourself. When Jesus sent Judas out, was it a nice, bright, sunshiny day? It was dark. Mm -hmm. right. yeah. And he did his deed in the dark. He went and made a deal for 30 pieces. Mm -hmm. In the dark. He thought he was in the dark, and he was in the dark, but Jesus knew. <coughs> Jesus knew. To go from dwelling with the sovereign <coughs> to bury <coughs> the strangers. Don't be a Judas. Okay. Don't make that line on that door, and don't try to be funny on me and say, well, not that door. Don't leave this property mm -hmm. without making your election and calling sure. Amen. If God has troubled you, He's working on that heart. Amen. He's working on the heart. So, what will you do with it? Because now it's laid in your lap. Mm -hmm. So, if tonight's your last night, and you bust hell wide open, it's on you. Mm -hmm. You've been told. You've rebelled against God. Amen. So I pray you would take that with you. And until we meet again, I, I hope that sticks with you. Mm -hmm. But if it's God's will tonight, there's plenty of people here that you can talk to and make sure. Mm -hmm. You can come to me. But would that be something to be able to rejoice in that? Mm -hmm. I'm not baiting you into it because I don't want you to come unless the Lord's calling you. Mm -hmm. John 6 says that he draws you. And we know the Greek there means he drags you. And I mentioned that, that he drug me kicking and screaming. God has to bring you in. Mm -hmm. Pastor Pierce can't bring you in. Make sure you're calling. Amen. Yeah, yeah.